Very cool. YouTubers, Facebookers and Instagrammers, I'm here to make you another vlog today and I'm going to cover one of those things I get asked about an awful lot, the whistle. Okay, so the whistle can encompass all sorts of different things at different points and in different ways. I obviously can't talk about everything that goes with whistling because that pretty much is all the training altogether, but I can touch on how I use my whistle and the pitches and uh, the tones that I use for what I'm doing. So I'm gonna start off with the whistle that probably most people probably will introduce first, which is what is considered to be the recall. I hear all sorts of things from time to time. I'm gonna talk about obviously how I use my recall. So recall for me is not about getting myself out of trouble. It's normally after I stop the dog, maybe uh, on a retrieve, I need to get the dog back a little bit, reposition it, or I might have stopped it at the end of my run with my dog, Normally the dog's only gonna be 10, 15 yards max. That's easy to get the dog back. Or the dog's coming back with a wing over its face so it can't see where it's going, so it's coming in on the sound. So for me, it's a gur, 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 gur sound and it's continuous from the point where I start asking the dog to come back to me until it gets in front of me. Some people now do you can either go pips, four pips. It's for me, it means continue. So for example, if a dog was out 50 yards and I've stopped it and I want to bring the dog in a short distance, for the whole time I'm doing that recall, I expect it to move. The second I stop, I expect that dog to sit up, at which point I might go into a left or a right but from there, okay? So for me, it's not about getting myself out of trouble. If you are looking to rely on recall to get yourself out of trouble, you are missing all the other training guys, okay? You can introduce this really early on and a puppy will react to anything at an early stage. You drop down on your knees, pup, 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 whistle. You can shout bacon, cheese, aeroplanes. They're probably gonna come back, okay? But it is a good time to introduce it, but don't think that's what's getting you out of trouble later on. Okay, the bit that I think is more important is number two, which is your turn whistle. A single pip, which you use your tip of your tongue on, pip, and then you can do a double pip. I don't mind which you do. Personally, I use a single. I did start out using a double, but I went to a single because it's one less whistle. It just made my runs clearer when I was trialing, and that's just what I prefer. But that's not to say that two isn't fine. Okay, so for me, Pip means wherever you are, whether out to the left, in front, come across my toes and keep moving, okay? Most people refer to it as the turn whistle or the quarter whistle, which I totally understand. Most dogs all the time are gonna have to turn to come across your toes, but to clarify with my clients, that's how I get them to look at it. If you pip your dog, i.e. turn it, in most cases, I want it across your toes and then out the other side. The dog can't choose how far out one day is correct and one day isn't. So I have a static point as far as where I feel if I couldn't reach out and touch the dog, that dog hasn't come across my toes. Anyway, that's a huge section of training. I'm obviously not gonna talk about all that because it's just impossible to do so, but that's my turn whistle, okay? So it's either or, and that means come across my toes. Okay, number three. Okay, that's my stop whistle. For me, you heard the whistle goes up at the end, okay? There's three different ways of describing it positive at the end. I want that positivity in my whistle, okay? I want it to stand out, I want it to be heard at distance, and I don't want it to be misled, uh, sorry, misread for any other. For example, turn, okay? A lot of times, sometimes people will be on for turn, but their stop is too similar, okay? I like them to stand out so it's very, very clear to the dog. That means stop, that means turn, there's no misunderstanding. The other interesting thing is I don't worry about putting a stop whistle in to my hunting pattern until I have a really good turn. It keeps it a little bit more simple, stops the dogs getting confused. Um, so that's a good tip there. Um, just remember also whether you're walking your dog at heel and you want it to sit, be consistent whether it's here or out there, it's the same stop whistle. Don't be doing different whistles for here, there and everywhere. One whistle, keep it clear for you and the dog, make it easy for the dog to understand. Okay, number four is my hump whistle. Now the hump whistle I used was introduced to me by a chap called Keith Breenfield, who if you're a retriever person will know, he won the IGL Retriever Championships a few years ago. And it's a warble sound. If you can do an impression of Chewy, uh, Chewbacca from Star Wars, you'd be able to do this. Okay, it's a warble from the back of the, uh, back of the throat. 
If you can't do that, which I find about 50-50 people can, so about 50% of the people that I see can do some interpretation of that hunt whistle. And some people can't, those, I get them to do a more traditional one. Whatever you do, again, like all the other whistles, stick to it and do the same thing over and over again. You can use a verbal, but personally for me, the whistle's in my mouth normally when I'm handling the dog, so it's much easier for me just to use that hunt whistle. It's just an extension um, of my voice, really, so it's the easiest thing for me to do when that whistle, as I said, is already in my voice. As far as introducing it goes, you have to be a little bit careful. I tend to put it in very, very slowly when I perhaps the dog's, I've put his head in a tennis ball and the dog's having a good hunt for it, then I might do a little short blast but I'll introduce it more and more as the dog goes. And the only reason being is sometimes it can be misread uh, for a recall. And obviously you don't wanna be pulling your dog away from that spot. So in the early days, I'll just be doing a short blast and I'll be increasing it, increasing it, increasing it until in the middle section and volume of my training, I'll be doing it. If the dog's within the area, I'll be doing it a whole time that dog is hunting that scent. And as the dog gets better and I start coming out the other side and more to an advanced level, I start reducing it again. So at the beginning, it might just be, in the middle section where I'm doing it a lot. I might be doing it the whole time that dog's hunting that area. I really want it to hear that sound while it's smelling that scent and starting to recognize every time I hear that sound, I know it must be here, it must be here. And then at a later day, I want to reduce it down because I don't want to be making too much noise. So if it was a trial dog, it might literally have sat the dog up. I might not want to be pushing the dog away from the retrieve because I feel it's somewhere underneath the dog, somewhere in and around it. So I'll just give the dog a short blast. By that point, it recognizes that sound so much. It's heard it a million times before, okay? And it recognizes it and says, it must be here. I trust my dad. Whenever I've heard that sound, I found the retrieve. And that's how it works for me. I've been to trials before where I've seen people do high loss, loss there, there, then some sort of hunt whistle. And for me, that immediately, I know that they haven't consistently taught that from the start because they're just clutching at straws, okay? So as I said, as long as you're consistent, introduce it a little bit. Lots during the main section when the dog's always hunting for it. And then as you start to get to more of an advanced level, you can just insert it in small amounts and the dog will recognize it by that point. Anyway, don't forget you can go through, link in, uh, uh, click down to the link in the description below. You can get yourself a two, a 10 and a half whistle, which is the standard one uh, for Spaniels. Some of the guys use a silent. Personally, I just like a two, 10 and a half. It's the easiest one, especially for novices. It's the easiest one to use. I recommend you get two guys, stick one in the glove box, one on your gear stick. The amount of times people turn up for lessons and they've forgotten their whistle, I always have them spare here to buy, but get yourself two if you haven't got one, and then you can keep one around your gear knob. But don't forget yourself a lanyard as well, one in the glove box, and the glove box one's your emergency one, and that way you'll never get caught out, guys. Anyway, I hope this has been some help. Um, don't for uh, forget to follow me on Facebook. Um, that really does help me, and the same on Instagram. And if you want to ask me any questions, go through to Facebook, send me a DM there, and I'll do my best to help you guys. Anyway, I hope that's been some use to you. Catch you later.